The gist of it is this, our ambulance service transports patients to your facilities in Fargo on a frequent basis. After the transport is complete, we're using our fax number. We've been using electronic PCR for a couple of years now and have the ability for your facilities to download our PCRs instead of, instead of getting faxes. Blah, 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 blah. Little plug for us. Uh, beginning June 17th, 2019, we will no longer fax our PCRs to your facility. Three hours later, I got a request from the hospital for their login. Three hours. I have a quote that I won't, I won't bother showing you the actual email, but it, it was, a, I'll just tell you what it said. It was from Connecticut Children's Hospital. When we gave him a login to the system to be able to receive data from not just our agencies, but all agencies that are sending them this data through, he wrote back, I've been waiting 13 years for this. Didn't have to build anything. It's an open pipe. It leverages standards. And they are able to download CCDs on the receiving side so they can take that data and do whatever they want with it. If they want to just look at the PDFs on screen, rock and roll. If they want to print them out, I hope they don't. But if they really do, rock and roll. But the point is, rather than talking about how I'm going to shove my data into your electronic health record, which is going to get your health information people to go insane, which is and not necessarily wrongly. Again, there's reasons for those protections. But you get to determine what you do with the information. My job is to give it to you. And because Nemesis lets me do that, I can do that in my systems from any EPCR that is Nemesis compliant. I convert that data into something that a hospital system can consume, and we let the hospital do what they want with it. If they want to build a bridge so that the data is automated, rock and roll. You want to just look at it on screen, print it out, save it into a file? You can do that too. But guess what it does in the meantime? It starts them having a conversation around what can we do with your data? As opposed to, I got a fax, I'm never really going to look at it. It's going to get lost. Someone, I don't remember if it was you or someone else, but someone was talking about the fairly realistic case that like the wind picks up and the thing gets, you know, pay door opens and the papers go flying on the floor. Um, as one of my agents who actually got eight hospitals in Connecticut and Massachusetts to go paperless on October 1st of last year. Um, he likes to phrase the uh, fax documents and even handoff forms as a walking HIPAA violation. Uh, not wrong. <laughs> so th this go this this takes it applies security to the system. It allows data to flow. But on the hospital side, it takes away how many processes? You don't need to print. You don't need to fax. You don't need to go to. You don't need to worry. This came up yesterday when they transmit 12 leads to at least one or two of the hospitals in the area. They just often don't have paper in the printer, so they can't get the 12 leads printed out to look at them. I mean, really? Both sides want that information to come in. Whoever didn't stock the printer with paper, imagine if the next, you know, they realize that two days later and all of a sudden these strips start pouring out of this thing. There's all kinds of risk there. So if I can take away a hospital's expense on not having to manage pieces of paper, and I can take away the ambulance services expense on not having to manage pieces of paper or print or whatever. Now you're bringing the two sides together to say what's next. And that's where we want to go. <laughs> so again, when we look at sort of where, where the industry is pointing, it's pointing towards this longitudinal collection of caregivers who see patients over and over again, sometimes in emergent settings, sometimes in non-emergent settings, sometimes for chronic diseases, sometimes because they're putting things in their bodies that shouldn't be there. And rather than see it as two parts of an ecosystem that don't talk to each other, we get to start labeling information to flow in a way that everybody is comfortable with. Again, the fact that whether you're looking at patients who are addicted to harmful substances or folks who are just looking for routine care and calling 911 as their doctor's office, the process is the same. Think about all the things that they touch, right? The ability to track patient care over time, the ability to look up information that's in a registry and know that it's clean when it got there. So one thing I wanted to make sure that I showed you, and this is, again, going to go out to a lot of people, but I hope you start to think about this. And I know Chuck is, and so we've talked a lot about it here, but this is happening in various places across the country. And I pick on places like, uh, actually, Arizona's resisted it so far, but Colorado came really close. North Carolina is at serious risk of doing this, which is, is to take the EMS data repository and stick it in a health information exchange. Oh, my God. You want to have a public health disaster? Do that without cleaning your EMS data first. Is how good is your quality control? Seriously, raise your eyebrows in the back. How good is your quality control? Let's assume instead of going into the system as, as Charles Apple, he goes in as Chuck Apple. Same person? Different person? My name is Jonathan Fite, spelled with an O-N at the end. 
There happens to be a lawyer, and she's actually cited in this article, this write-up. There happens to be a lawyer in North Carolina named Jonathan Fight with an A-N at the end. So let's assume I go, I'm at, say, EMS Today uh, in Charlotte, and I have a problem, and I get transported to a facility that's utilizing a bridge between EPCR and Health Information Exchange that has not bothered to make sure that, you know, we are both separate in the system. It turns out he's 10 years older than me. He has whatever, inf you know, health information is in there. And someone says, his name is Jonathan Fight, and they spell it the way it sounds, the way anyone but my dad would have spelled my name. And it turns out I'm a diabetic. So they treat me accordingly. But I had actually just gone to lunch, and I'd had a problem there. So my blood sugars may be a little bit high, but I'm by no means a diabetic. What just happened? This is happening right now. But there was an interest in Colorado driven by people, well-meaning folks, to save time and consolidate knowledge and so on by taking the data from the, uh, it happens to be an image trend powered uh, uh, data repository and connect it to something called Corio, which is this, the, the largest regional health information organization in Colorado. And pointing out that one of the people involved's name was Michael. And if he's also in the system as Mike, and there's no reconciliation of that, you could have a very, very serious problem on your hands. There is, there are very few, I wouldn't say none, but there are very few EMS agents, pre-hospital care agencies in general, that have that level of QA. And one of the reasons, and this is where you know, the, the fact of pre-hospital care as part of an ecosystem is very important, and I think for our friends from Epic and from the hospitals to think about as well, this is actually why we are not active in Commonwealth anymore. Uh, the Commonwealth Health Alliance was an effort to move toward a universal patient ID, where you could essentially look up your patient anywhere, and you know you could have a, someone from you know from Wisconsin, in Wisconsin who's from California who travels someplace else and mm -hmm. has a problem, and you could find the records and use an ID. Turns out there's a problem when it comes to EMS because we like to be complicated. We are the only, only part of the United States healthcare system, actually the worldwide healthcare system, that deals with unknown patients. There is not a single other aspect of the healthcare system where you have somebody showing up without a name. Unless, I mean, they may have amnesia, but they're somewhere, right? You don't have unconscious patients showing up in doctor's offices. So you can end up with a requirement in the HIE interoperability structure that says you need to provide consent, which is what Commonwealth initially did, that you have to consent to searching throughout all of these health record systems to allow your patient data to be pulled in. That is something that needs to be taken into account. Right? We go by the information that we have, and it's why, going back to the idea of handing off this information to a hospital, for example, that is both legally and clinically valid, it's often asked of me, well, what happens if the information changes? Right? You hand off the information at point of handoff, and then you go back and you do the rest of your chart, and there's something else that's in there. And my answer was, it doesn't matter. You know why? Because what you told them was what you knew at the time. So, so... All you're doing is giving the same information that you would otherwise be giving verbally, but in a way that can be consumed, that can be acted upon, that doesn't get lost in the ether when I got seven people around me trying to figure out what room to put the patient in, right? So there isn't any legal liability generated by writing down what you know at this time any more than there is relaying that information verbally, except that you're concretizing it and you can update it later with more information, which is exactly what happens anyway. And then that information should be able to be given back to you in a fashion that allows you to fill in the gaps. So I often get asked the question, why would a hospital, for example, want to participate in, if it means that they have to put data into a portal, for example. And we had a little bit of a laugh yesterday about the idea that if anybody ever needed help adding a tab to a browser, I'm happy to you know, give me a call, I'll tell you how to do it. Um, but the fact is, if we look at the operational cost of phone calls, it's pretty expensive. But if you, if you ask a hospital, will they bother to give you back in, information about, say, outcomes or missing insurance information or demographics? And often the assumption by pre-hospital providers is why would they bother to do that? They're busy enough. They're already writing all this information in electronic health records. <coughs> no, they're not. But they're already – assuming that that information is being entered somewhere, why, they wouldn't want to do double duty. They're not going to give you that information back. So instead, what happens? You pick up the phone and you call the hospital two days later when you're missing information or Kevin and his team call and say, hey, we, we need some information sent out to us. The information wasn't captured. We need it to be able to bill efficiently. Do you think the hospital wants that phone call coming in? Cost them a whole lot more than it costs you, right? So 
when it becomes a value-based conversation of does it make economic sense for them to say, yeah, we're not going to hit control C on this little, ver no, no. we're putting it in the discharge note anyway. We're not going to put it someplace else because it's extra work. Instead, I'm going to take your phone calls. So someone came up yesterday and sort of said, how would you compel a hospital system to share information with you like that if they don't want to? And I said, well, you know, you didn't hear this from me, but let's just say you, you know, you can't force a hospital to participate, right? I mean, there's, there's not, there's, you know, you're all separate but equal. You're not, there's no mandate there to participate. So instead you say, look, I accept that I can't force you to, to play nice with me. You don't need to. But if you don't, I'm going to have one of my crews calling you every top of the hour and bottom of the hour. And we're just going to call, keep calling until you get us the information that we want. In, in, in the San Francisco area, one of my friend of mine runs a service that transports to Stanford. And their statistic is they can, they can take up to 72 hours to get insurance information back from wherever it goes in the hospital, Stanford, who knows, it goes into a nuclear accelerator or something. Um, 72 hours? Think about how expensive that is. But you know who it's more expensive for? Stanford. That's a real great way to get people to play nice. Rather than say it's for the good of the order, which, you know, it's also not necessarily it's inconvenient, right? But it's a whole lot less convenient to have to deal with the, the lag on both sides. So the first place that I deployed that capability was at St uh, in an institutional fashion was at Centura Health Castle Rock in the southern, southern part of Denver. And I got to tell you, it was one of the most exciting meetings I think I've ever had. Um, Pre-hospital care director, great guy, but he was very concerned. Hospital's not going to want to play nice. Right? They don't want to share. They're not going to want to change their process. They have a process. And it involves going to a fax room, and they get the data come in, and yada, yada, yada. They're not going to want to change. Chief medical officer of the hospital is in this meeting. Two fire services are in this meeting. Reg team is in the meeting. Nurses are in the meeting. There's like a whole conference room of people. This meeting lasted eight minutes, at which point I explained that data was going to be able to be received. There's two different fire departments. One was using my system. One was using someone else's called High Plains. Uh, and data could be received electronically inside the hospital, viewable on a screen at the registration desk. Real time from one, not real time from the other, digital from both, no more faxes. Literally, registration team looks at me and says, I'm sorry. Did you say we're never going to have to go to the fax machine ever again? Yes. Sold. Chief medical officer, medical officer gets up. He's like, that is the fastest meeting I have ever seen. You think they like the fax machine? Come on. Like the idea that somebody can't, can't figure out a better way and be trained on a better way or adopt it on their own if they knew it was available. I mean, the idea of keeping tabs in a window. We were talking about this just yesterday. The, again, the assumption that hospitals aren't going to want more than one portal to go into to get their information. First of all, they do that now. So... That's not really a thing. Um, but the idea that, let's assume there are, I believe, Chuck, you said there are nine EPCRs or so in the state, yeah. give or take. So you've got a system from my company, Beacon. You've got ESO. You've got Image Trend, right? That's three. There are nine EPCR systems. Imagine if you had a situation where you had one portal from ESO, one portal from Image Trend, and one portal for everybody else. Or you could have nine faxing you stuff. Not a hard concept to wrap your brain around. The efficiency capabilities um, of consolidating in that way become compelling, but it can't be about just being nice, right? And this is where, where I have found it incredibly exciting when you can sort of break these things down into specific numbers. If it becomes, well, it's the right thing to do to share information, sure. But, you know, efficiency and process and retraining and all that stuff. If instead it becomes about you're spending large amounts of money managing pieces of paper that are also vulnerable to risk, and, uh, EMS, and that's on the hospital side, and on the EMS side, you're spending money on faxing things where you don't get any information back. You don't necessarily know if it got to where it needed to go. You send this stuff into a black hole, and hopefully you get back what you need later, maybe if you call enough times to get it. And instead, we boil that down to an interoperable process where we can get folks in the room who can say, this is what we're going to need on the hospital side. And this is what you're going to need on the pre-hospital side. All of a sudden, we have that relationship being built. And that ends up being what so much of this is about. And so whether you're talking about sharing data or tracking data, um, my first long, long time ago chief medical officer pointed out to me that you can't, you can't boil down a conversation in a 
professional context to just it's a nice thing to do, right? In order to get people to move, it becomes about increasing revenue and reducing cost. And in the benefit, if you end up doing something nice for people too, that's great, right? But people understand the language of it costs me less to do something and I'm getting more out of it, or I make money doing it and so it's worth, worth the cost. And this is where, when it comes to interoperability, but also patient tracking over time, we really have not done a great service uh, explaining that to both sides of the, of the handoff. So that's really where we're at. Um, I'm going to transition a little bit, speaking of the money, to talking about community paramedicine and interoperability, so how they come together. I'm going to step outside of the phrase community paramedicine for a minute, because I think it's a loaded phrase, it's got local baggage, it is what it is. Um, the concept of tracking patients over time is really what we're talking about. Whatever the purpose of that is, whether it's called mobile integrated health, opiate diversion, uh, some you know uh, community health integrated paramedics. Uh, ultimately, the uh, the concept I think is sort of what's important. And what I want where I want to start here is transitioning and tying this idea um, back to the concepts of pre-hospital health information exchange that we were just talking about by by pointing out that this opportunity to see patients coming in and out of the system and track them over time is a massive so what for the concept of, sh of, of sharing data right if you're capturing the information anyway right now epcr whatever brand you're using whatever form you consider whether it's patient specific or incident specific or whatever um kind of goes into a black hole of information right so Yes, it gets built on, hopefully. Uh, yes, it gets shared with the state, although what it, what ends up being done with that data is sort of depends on where you are as to how deeply that's used, if used at all. Um, but if instead of looking at this as a legal document, a CYA, a receipt like we talked about, we start looking at it as a collection of insight that you have captured over your patient for a specific moment in time tied to what's coming next and resultant of everything that came before, um, it transitions, again, from being just sort of a practice of collecting information for its own sake to the so what, right? This is why we're going to, this, what, what we build, I mean, the, the concept of fire and EMS as a business, I think, is emerging, um, private or public, right? The concept of accounting for your value is something that is hitting every brand of pre-hospital care everywhere in the country. Um, and... Community paramedicine in all of its forms, and I'm just going to use that term because it's comfortable to me, uh, becomes a really interesting opportunity to do that and to emphasize the idea that your relationship with your community, your relationship with your patient is incredibly intimate, right? When we talked for a minute earlier about the fact that, you know, fire and EMS are allowed into places that police, for example, can't go. Um, there has been a controversy in places like California, somewhat overblown. Um, about the, di the, the, the controversy between the nursing unions and the fire EMS organizations. Yeah, largely overblown. Um, one of the reasons for that is because you guys go into places that a lot of nurses don't want to go. Um, and in fact, that seems to, in many cases to have been sort of the, the epilogue of a lot of the controversy in the programs is, um, you know, if, if you're a patient, who's a mental health patient, possibly violent to them, you know, a threat to themselves or others, um, you know, high drug use involved, other, you know, hoarder, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's not been uncommon for the nursing groups in the region to kind of say, you know what, you can have them. Uh, and that's totally comfortable to folks who are used to going into high risk environments anyway, right? So what you end up with is you end up with a niche. And that niche is not necessarily small, uh, but that niche has largely been under, uh, I guess, under-researched, right? The, the information about, about the impact on those patients, the cost of servicing those environments, the benefits of doing so and whatnot has largely been undersold uh, and underexplored. And, and a, a lot of it is because, at least in what I call community paramedicine 1.0, it's been about for the good of the community. And it's never been tied back into ongoing operations. Right. Everybody in the again, we talked about how many people get in this business to do paperwork. I don't think anybody gets in this business to make patients sick either. Right. We all have our hearts in the right place. The question is, can we can, can, can we continue doing that? And can you you know, when I uh, I was in the, the, the mobile integrated health, sorry if I repeat myself, but um, 
I think this came up yesterday, not today. The Mobile Integrated Health Network meeting in Phoenix that I attended a couple weeks ago, one of the uh, leadership of the city of Phoenix made a compelling statement when he said, we're not here to make money. We're here to serve our community. To That's true. Yeah, I think he's absolutely right, except I basically said, you know, it does like cost money to keep your lights on and stuff. Uh, so the idea that if you want to build a program around community paramedicine in whatever its form, and you are particularly in concerned about taking people off the line or hiring people that you might not have budget to hire, whether you want to or not, that you may not have a budget to do that in that particular calendar year. Wouldn't it be neat if like the program could, could, could pay for itself? Then you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and you get to contribute back to your community. You also get to say, you know, we had to hire more people or buy that new QRV that you need so that you can have someone affording to go out and do this work. And you don't have to worry about the tin cup because take it from a guy who runs a small company, uh, asking, talking to investors is really distracting and, you know, just not something that you want to be doing when you want to be doing the good work. So if instead of thinking about money after the fact, we build this into the structure of these programs and their charters from the get go, it changes what we do to engage them because we're thinking about evidence at step one. In Arizona, in Texas, uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, in a number of places that have engaged in sort of the first round of community paramedicine program, the agencies themselves have been pretty, pretty free in admitting that they never built sustainability into their model. Right? So by the time they realized they were running out of grant funding and they didn't have any evidence, evidence to prove the value, it became very hard for them to say, you should keep this thing going. And it wasn't built into itself, so it wasn't generating revenue. Um, yesterday, one of the departments that, that was here um, is from the Milwaukee area, and they've been running a program for a while. And the, the, um, the individual who was here was very keen to talk about all the great things that their program has done. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, I was really glad that he was proud of it. And he should be proud of it. And then I asked him to prove it. And I asked him again. He said, of course we can prove it. Prove it. Actually, we can't prove it. And you don't have any data at all to be able to prove what you've done. So you know what you've done. You can talk about what you've done. I'm trying to turn the tables on that by basically saying, what if we think, what if we think about businesses as businesses, right? And whether you're a municipal business or you're a private service, um, the idea of self-sustaining growth orientation and maybe maybe it's profit in a private setting or it's returning money into your own budget so that you can grow in a nonprofit setting, or that you can spin out this program and have it be completely self-sustaining, or that you can, instead of focusing on you know oh, 20 patients with two cl uh, clinical cohorts, you can hire somebody to do this full time, or in the case of one of the agencies I work with, you'll see in another, maybe you can manage for others uh, and and help them get where you don't have the infrastructure to get to. You know, if, if I were to talk about the UPMC model or the MedStar model or REMSA. Uh, or Eagle County or Mesa, Arizona, pretty much everybody's going to know what I'm talking about because there's basically like six community paramedicine programs that get highlighted at every single conference. Uh, same people. And the, besides the fact that there's a whole lot more of these going on, a lot of different flavors that are probably worth learning from, um, one of the challenges of these community paramedicine 1.0 programs uh, is that they're not really easy to replicate. In fact, they're largely fairly unique. For example, the MedStar model, I mean, Matt Savatsky is a brilliant guy. I mean, he's done phenomenal work advancing this cause, but very few places can replicate what MedStar has done because of the relationship between MedStar and its city. As a private provider, that is essentially a contractor to a city and has relationships with the hospitals that it has. Unless you have those, it's very hard to do that. And you're not really going to put pull a whole new business structure you know, for your EMS agency over a span of a year, I mean, that's a, that's a big lift. Um, in Pittsburgh, it's even more complicated. It's the only area of agreement that the UPMC and Allegheny Health Network have with one another. So we have not done as an industry a great job of unpacking these programs and understanding what is replicable, what is not, what resources do you already have that allow you to do that? And that's why I kind of threw out the bomb at the beginning of our conversation today around this concept of staffing versus data. Right. So so the cost of community paramedicine programs is, a, is often the hurdle or perceived hurdle for starting them. Um, I am of the bias that these types of programs are a good thing. I am also of the bias that these programs are here to stay in one way or another. 
uh, whether they are called what they're called or whether they sort of you know, laser in on opioids or whatever it is. I think the idea of the return of the house call by folks who are capable of dealing with an emergent event is probably a good thing uh, and has a lot of place. But the question of how many people we need and how big the program needs to be and do you take a person off a line to do this program and so on and so forth have become a bit of a distraction. When what you really need to be able to do in order to make your whatever this program is called a success is to analyze your data. And this is where the fact of most one of the common elements of the, the 1.0 programs is that data came at the end, right? So in fact, it was in Milwaukee, was the first person in this industry to use the word choke in context of the documentation they were using to run their community prayer medicine program. It wasn't designed for that. Could be, but the way they were using it wasn't designed for that. And so unless you knew how to translate individual record data into the longitudinal data to see that person's context over time, you were not able to demonstrate what you were doing. And I loved what they were doing. And it was incredibly challenging that without understanding the, the, the way the data needed to be used, it became very difficult to emphasize what was being captured versus what wasn't and what needed to be handed off to somebody else. Um, and so I would want to encourage you to think about community paramedicine as not so much a staffing model, not a I need to go to your home five times a week model, but a do you need me to do that model? Right? It's an information engagement. And you have most of that capability in your hands if you're documenting reliably today. Um, how many of your agencies have engaged in hotspot tracking? Show of hands. Okay, three. So how many of you have patients that you see, say, more than three or four times a month? So for any of those who are engaging with your patients in that way, but not running your data to see that and why they're coming in and what's come, what's bringing them in, um, you are missing out on the opportunity to understand how you need to engage with these folks. But it turns out, again, we talked about... Um, the idea of sort of investing in technology or suffering with what you have versus picking up the phone and calling the hospital and saying, I'm going to call you every 30 minutes, right? Wouldn't it be amazing if you have a patient who, for example, is lonely or fearful um, and all they really want is someone to talk to? That happened in Contra Costa County, in my county in California. Uh, there's one patient who falls into the mega user category who apparently has some mental illness and she has a phobia and routinely will be seen eight times a week. Our county doesn't have a community prevention program. It isn't allowed to under California law, but everybody knew she was going to call. They were expecting the next dispatch call to her house 10 minutes after they left. Wouldn't it make sense to have a phone? Maybe give her a phone. Maybe, you know, buy her a phone and make sure that it has your number programmed into it so that when you call to say, hey, how's it going? She knows that you're on the end of the line. And if she needs to call you, maybe it's more effective for her to pick up the phone and call you than to even go out and check on her all those many times. So that becomes a question of how you're analyzing your data and what you're doing once you learn about what that information is. Um, another example from a, a successful community paramedicine program came out of Alameda County. I mentioned Alameda didn't get all the credit that it deserved for being the first place to demonstrate interoperability between EPCR and hospital side data. So hopefully you guys take that message home because they deserve a lot of credit for doing that. Um, but there's a very famous story that uh, they like to tell when they recount the successes of their CP program, which is now in its third or something year and is being funded by a whole bunch of different places. Um, that there was a patient who was chronically malnourished. And it turns out that the two areas, and I'll get to the economics of some of these others, but the two areas of engagement in community paramedicine actually bear out the 30-day readmission avoidance model. The only two that we can find in the literature are malnourishment and loneliness. Those are the ones. Everything else gets more expensive. But if you give people food and they're chronically malnourished, they aren't chronically malnourished anymore, and they're able to not have to call for help. So it turns out that there was this woman in the, in the city who was chronically malnourished, and she was bedridden and uh, visually impaired. So she was having a tough time, and she was calling 911 for help all the time. 
Well, when she got brought into this program, because she was a crew, there's, there's three levels in, in, at least in Alameda, there's the, 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 chron the frequent users, the super users, and the mega users. The mega users are the ones that have actually been found as calling 300 times a day <coughs> for help. So these are serious, serious problem, right? Very expensive and so on and so forth. I think she was a super user. She would call all the time. And uh, they found out all these things. Again, chronic malnourishment, shortness, of, or visually impaired and bedridden. And it turns out that she was eligible for food stamps. So the question was, why isn't she eating, right? If she's eligible for food stamps. Well, California, in all our wisdom, because, you know, we never screw anything up, um, requires you to have an ID to get your food stamps. But she couldn't drive. So she couldn't get to the DMV, so she couldn't get her ID. So she couldn't get her food stamps, even though she'd qualified for them. So the CPs literally put her in the back of an SUV and drove her to the DMV, sat there with her for an hour, got her an ID, which allowed her, allowed her to get her food stamps, which allowed her to call one time in the following. Sorry, I just got to chill. I love that story. Um, allowed her to get a, 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 you know, she called one time for help in the next year and it was because she stubbed her toe or something. Completely irrelevant. And, and what a remarkable engagement that was in terms of saving costs, for sure, making health better, for sure. Right? We talked about the three buckets of information, and there was that fourth one that I tried to sort of ignore from a technical perspective, and it was the social factors. Right? But again, I've never encountered a single community that has a drug problem that doesn't know all its patients, and where they live, what bridge they live under, how they got there, and how many of the patients who are calling you eight times a week do you not know their story? You probably know their social security number by heart. Right? So the idea that you, you can engage with them and be able to say, based on what our needs are, what programs are we going to have to build around you, the next question that becomes... Oh, sorry, I meant to put this up before. But the, the next question becomes, who cares? Right? So you do, because you know you want to do a good job. But when we talk about businesses being self-sustaining, I can't talk to you about eliminating your fax processes and going to a patient, you know, pre-hospital HIE, unless I know you have a fax problem and that you have an expense problem and a HIPAA problem and all sorts of other things, right? So the question is, who generates value that is willing to pay you for solving the problem that they have. And it turns out that's not a question most CP type programs have ever asked. But there are some very specific, um, I would say not even specific, but each community has specific problems that it can solve through a more uh, routine engagement with patients that are coming in and out of the pre hospital care system, ending up in health record systems ending up in hospitals that, you know, as we were talking about during the break, you know, if you have all of your advocate systems connected and this patient goes to Cook County General in Chicago, they're gone. You don't see anything. There are technologies in some cases that can help with that, like health information exchange, but you cross a state line. They're in this article that I mentioned before that I published for uh, uh, in EMS world. And there's a complimentary one uh, that I'd be happy to send to anyone who wants it called the brutal effects of, uh, of addiction. And it sort of ties into that. Uh, <laughs> it was funny. I don't often get responses to my, uh, to my articles. Unfortunately, no, no journalist does. Uh, I started out in the journalism world. So I'm kind of used to putting words into the black hole and you hope somebody says something. So I cited the fact that a physician, emergency physician from Cleveland pointed out that in Ohio, there's a little bit of a drug problem. All it takes is walking across a bridge and you're in another state where you can get whatever meds you'd like. And the Ohio Board of Pharmacy has no idea that you've gotten them. And so they wrote back when I put this article and said, oh, we have a statewide system that can track the use of any, you know, the, the prescription of any medication uh, in our state. Sure, but that's not what we're talking about. Not a far trip from Chicago to Milwaukee, right? So the idea that you can cross that border and you are gone. For whatever reason, we, we have not, I don't, it's a longer conversation than now, but, you know, those those state border lines present barriers to data sharing. Uh, and now you're talking about doing it in between electronic health record systems, which may be on different systems that still are kind of ironing out the kinks around interoperability. So there are very specific problems that can be addressed by, for example, you guys going out into the field and sort of serving as the glue between the electronic health record systems that don't see information about each other. Think about in California, where we have in San Francisco, fire, AMR, and one private provider called King American Ambulance. Um, that's who I work with. There's three sections, and they and and you have patients that literally can go across the street and obtain uh, narcotics because there's no visibility on the other side of the street that they were just transported. We talk about it in the context of veterans, right? 
there there is no information sharing but the people who do know that are the different services they could share data with one another and imagine if you look at a place like you in pittsburgh where i mentioned that upmc and allegheny health came together for that purpose wouldn't it be neat if instead of each fire service or ems service building its own community per medicine program we took a regional approach and you can still operate them independently, but every so often you share information or you utilize the EPCRs that you're using, whether they're the same system or others, and you abstract that data. What if we're able to take that data and we're able to say, how is this being targeted to solve specific problems in your region based on what your needs are? 